A lot of the people who watch my videos are parents. Parents of young children. And being a parent means that you have the duty to ensure that absolutely no harm comes to your child. And a lot of you would inflict a furious wrath on anyone who dared harm your child. And today we have a man who did just that. Gary Plochet. But before we get into the mad lad coming right at you, it is your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. The hottest game on the Play Store with almost a perfect score. Assemble your team of champions to fight your way through the story mode or do what my favourite thing in the game is, slap people around in the PvP arena. Raid now has 500 champions for you to collect, not 400 anymore, it's 500 because they're always adding more champions. They invest a lot of time into the production quality of the game and adding in new, highly detailed and fully animated characters. This is because they have their own in-house motion capture studio that captures all of the super fluid movements and attacks that you see in the game. Each character model is uniquely rigged with its own animations, from the way they stand right up to their fighting style. That is some serious investment in the game. In the September update, over 20 new champions have been added to the game and the forge has been added so you can start crafting your own artifacts to give your team an edge over their enemies. So click my link down below to download Raid Shadow Legends and you will get 100,000 silver, 50 gems, 10 mystery shards and a free champion, Slasher, who does exactly what it says on the tin. These rewards are only available to new players and only for the next 30 days, and you can find all of them here, in your inbox. Leon Gary Plochet was born on the 10th of November, 1945, and he had a very normal, very standard American upbringing. He then married his wife, June Plochet, and they started a family together. Gary supported his family through his job as a travelling salesman, and he also helped coach his local junior football team. And like any other dad, he wanted his kids to be involved in hobbies, sports and other activities. So when his nine-year-old son, Jody Ploche, told him that he wanted to take up karate, Gary took him in the car down to the local karate dojo and enrolled him. And it was at this karate dojo that Gary and Jody would first meet Jeffrey Doucette who was an instructor at the dojo. Jeffrey Doucette seemed like such a lovely, friendly guy. He was always really helpful with all of the kids, and he would also always take the kids on really fun days out. It seems that he really liked kids. Really, really liked kids. After a while of taking Jody to the karate classes, Gary Plochet found out a few things about Jeffrey Doucette. He found out that he had no close friends and no relatives in the area, and that his only income was from the karate school, and Jeffrey Doucette was so poor that he was actually living in the karate school because he didn't have the money to live anywhere else, and the karate school didn't have the proper facilities. So Gary Plochet, being the good man that he was, wanted to help Doucette. I remember one time my dad felt so bad for him because we were going to eat family dinner and my dad started crying and he's like, he's so pitiful. And I'm like, what? And he goes, he just, he doesn't have anybody. So my dad picked him up, brought him home, let him shower, gave him a fresh shirt to wear and then took him to my grandparents' house to eat Sunday dinner that we did every Sunday. After having dinner with the Plochets, Doucette became very close with the family. He became a close family friend. He would go on outings with them, he would have dinner with them and he would even teach young Jody, who was now 10 years old, how to drive his car. 
And this is where the story starts to go down a very dark path. We took turns just riding around this neighborhood. Just, he would, he would do the stick shift and the clutch and we would steer. Well, we were driving around the block and all of a sudden he put his hands in my lap and I'm like, uh-oh. And then, uh, then he quit. And then I was like, okay, maybe that was an accident. And then I'm driving a little bit more and it happens again. And I'm like, whoa, well, that was, that was him testing the boundaries to see how I respond. And then, and I guess I passed the test. After this test, Doucette got a lot bolder. And while he and the rest of the kids from the dojo were on a trip to a karate competition in Houston, Texas, Doucette took Jody to his hotel room and... I'll spare you the details. Unfortunately, after... that... Doucette forcing himself on Jody became a regular occurrence and Jody, being only 10 years old, was too scared to tell anyone about it. So the abuse continued. The only person who noticed something was up was Gary Plochet's brother, Jeffrey Plochet, when there was about to be another karate trip to Dallas, Texas to save money on a hotel room for Jody. Gary Plochet asked his brother, Jeffrey Plochet, if Jody could just stay with him because Jeffrey lived in Dallas. So when Doucette dropped Jody off at his uncle's house, he kissed Jody on the mouth. But what he didn't know is that Jody's uncle Jeffrey saw him do it. And so Jeffrey immediately told his brother Gary. Unfortunately, because Doucette had become such a close friend of the family, Gary Plochet defended him, telling his brother that surely he must be mistaken and that Doucette would never do a thing like that. For the next six months, the abuse continued, mostly happening in hotel rooms during karate trips, but eventually it started happening in the karate school itself when no one was around. What made things even worse for Jody during this time is that his parents, Gary and June Ploche, were getting divorced. So with Jody's home life being such a mess, a lot of people feel that this made him even more vulnerable and made him feel dependent on Doucette, which made him easier to abuse. Then, on the 19th of February, 1984, Jeffrey Doucette arrives at Jodie's mother's house and tells her that he needs help with an errand and he needs Jodie to help him. So June Plochet just lets Jodie go with Doucette. But after several hours, she hadn't heard anything back from them. There was no sign of Jodie. Then... After more hours pass, with no sign from Jodie, June Ploche starts to panic, so she contacts the police, who begin a search for Jodie. But Jodie was in Doucette's car, being driven all the way to California. Doucette seems to have come up with a plan to kidnap Jodie so that they could run away together. And if anybody were to ask any questions, Doucette was just going to tell them that he was Jodie's father. Ten days had passed since Jodie went missing, when suddenly, out of the blue, June Plochet's phone rings. It was Doucette telling her that Jodie really wanted to speak to her. It turned out that Jodie really missed his mother and was pestering Doucette to let him speak to her. Doucette eventually gave in and allowed a phone call to happen. So June Ploche spoke to Jodie and she was very, very happy to hear from her son and hear that he was all right. But then she asked Jodie to hand the phone to Doucette and she told Doucette that she was really, really happy to hear from him too and really happy to hear that he was okay too, much to Doucette's surprise. She then told Doucette that she was 
very understanding of why he did what he did and she didn't blame him for it and she wasn't angry at him for it. Now, why the hell would this woman talk to the man who kidnapped her son in such a way? Why would she seem so happy to talk to Jeffrey Doucette? Because there were four FBI agents sitting around her and she had to keep Doucette on the phone long enough for them to trace the call. Clever girl. The call was traced to the Samoa Hotel in Anaheim, California, and the FBI alerted the local authorities who were rushing to the scene. So June stayed on the phone with Doucette, being all nice and friendly, to keep Doucette on the phone as long as possible to make sure that he stayed exactly where he was. She managed to keep him on the phone for so long that she got to listen to the cops raiding the hotel room. I hear this banging on the door and it, the guy was yelling, break, break, police. And I heard the phone hit the table and I could still hear them, get up against the wall, get up, and then boom, it goes dead. Jeffrey Doucette was immediately arrested for aggravated kidnapping and taken into custody and Jody was rescued. Jody was taken to a hospital where he was examined by forensic experts who took samples from him, and the next day he was flown back to Louisiana to be reunited with his parents. And upon being reunited with his parents, they noticed that Jeffrey Doucette had dyed Jody's hair black in an attempt to disguise him. A lot of media had gathered to capture the moment with Gary Plochet himself even given a short interview. As a parent in your position, did, did you learn anything from this? Just how much I love my children. Uh, I might be a little bit more protective or overprotective, I don't know. After he got home, Jody was taken to the police station to answer questions and hand over any and all information that he could to assist in the police's case against Jeffrey Doucette. But Jody was very quiet and didn't want to talk about it, which, aye, understandable. Two weeks after Jodie came back, the forensic experts presented their results, which proved that Jodie had in fact been abused. The news of this absolutely broke Gary Plochet. He had a complete mental breakdown upon hearing this. He felt like a complete failure as a father, he should have noticed the warning signs, he should have listened to his brother, he should have done something. He felt that he had completely failed his child. And that he had to do something to make things right. On the 16th of March, 1984, Jeffrey Doucette, escorted by two detectives, was being flown from California back to Louisiana so that he could stand trial for the kidnap and abuse of Jody Plochet. And while he was on the plane, flying back, Jeffrey Doucette started confessing to the two detectives that Jody was far from the only child he abused. He had uh, confessed to a number, molesting a number of children many, many, many times. He couldn't even remember how many times. We were going to build a case against him and was going to send him to the penitentiary for the rest of his life. So Jeffrey Doucette had landed in Louisiana and was being escorted out of the airport by the two detectives. And remember what I said earlier, where parents will inflict a furious wrath on anyone who dares harm their child. Gary Plochet was waiting for him. Oh no, what, what happened? What ha oh no, how terrible, that's just, that's just awful, how terrible, oh no. Gary Plochet was in disguise and using a payphone. And just as Jeffrey Doucette was walking past, Gary Plochet 180 no scopes him right in the head. All of the Baton Rouge police officers who were at the airport that day to escort Jeffrey Doucette 
all knew who Gary Ploche was, but not from the investigation. It was because they were all drinking buddies with them. So instead of opening fire on Gary, they instead ran over to him and grabbed the gun out of his hand while screaming, Why Gary, why? Gary Ploche was immediately arrested and charged with second degree murder. Geoffrey Doucette was taken to hospital but died the next day. Some people theorised that because Gary Ploche was drinking buddies with a lot of cops and detectives, that one of them told Gary the time and the place that Geoffrey Doucette was going to be. But it was later revealed that it was actually an unnamed employee of a local news station that told Gary the time and the place. Now, did this unnamed employee know of Gary's intentions? We just don't know. Though it does seem that Gary had not told anyone about what his plans were. Not even his ex-wife June. And when June was given an interview and she was asked, what did she say to Gary after he killed Jeffrey Doucette? She gave a fantastic response. Now it's probably when I said to him, the least you could have done was let me drive you. The least you could have done was let me drive you. Ah, uh, shouldn't have divorced her, Gary. She's a good one. Despite the fact that Gary Ploche had, in fact, murdered Jeffrey Doucette, all of the public were supporting Gary. Phone calls are pouring in from all over the country, offering both money and moral support. Ploche's actions stirred powerful emotions in people who could picture themselves in his place. So Gary Ploche's trial started and his defence team argued that upon hearing of his son's prolonged abuse, Gary Ploche had a psychotic episode, which was made even worse by coming to the realisation that Geoffrey Doucette, a man he tried to help, had been manipulating him and his family for years just so he could abuse Jodie. Gary Ploche took a plea deal, where the second degree murder charge was dropped, and Gary pleaded no contest to the reduced charge of manslaughter. Allegedly, during the trial, when the judge asked Gary Ploche to explain his actions, Gary Ploche looked him right in the eyes and said, if you were in my position, you would have done the exact same thing. The judge handed down his sentence. Seven years in prison. Suspended. Five years probation and 300 hours of community service. Gary Ploche didn't spend a day in prison and he just walked straight out of the courthouse. They were not going to convict Gary of of shooting the guy who molested his son. Uh, that wasn't going to happen, not in Baton Rouge. And Gary Ploche just continued with his life as normal. So where are they now? Well, Jody Ploche is all grown up now and he's actually an anti-abuse advocate and he travels America giving seminars to teach people how to recognize the early warning signs of child abuse so that they can fight against it and, more importantly, prevent it. As for Gary Ploche, in 2011 he suffered a stroke and then he died in 2014 in a nursing home after suffering a second stroke. But before he died, despite it being very difficult for him to speak due to the first stroke, Gary Ploche gave one final interview. Do you regret killing Jeff Doucette? No. No. Would you do it again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he doesn't give a shit. <laughs>
Thank you on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.